uh, I have become very close to Stephen Jay Gould. Um, I will, um, I, I, I'll come back to this. Um, Stephen Jay Gould had a monthly column in the magazine Natural History, which he had maintained, I think, for 25 years. He had written 300 articles, uh, whether he felt well or ill, and there were times when he was almost fatally ill, he would have an article every month without fail in natural history. Um, but he died early in 2002, and um, I was asked to fill in for him uh, and write an article about astrobiology, so-called, um, life on other planets possibilities, what might it be like. Uh, it was an assignment I enjoyed because I have a taste for science fiction and I thought of all the Wellesian novels and the War of the Worlds and uh, the First Men on the Moon and so forth. Um, and, uh, but um, there was a new editor, not Steve's editor, Steve's pieces had never been messed around with by an editor. They really went straight through. Whereas this new editor was very pernickety and, um, and also very reluctant to send me a proof. He said, we don't use proofs. I said, but you know, how, how can we work together if I don't have a proof? I was then sent a proof and we agreed, or I thought we had agreed on what was there, what was to be said, but when the article came out, it had some sentences, whole sentences, which made me cringe because I hadn't said them, I would never put them in this way, and they had been stuck in by the editor. Um, I, I was considerably upset at this. Um, uh, I think now this particular editor has, uh, has matured and mellowed and is probably very good and it was, it was an unfortunate coincidence that I got him at what he felt was, was a very vulnerable time and, had and was submitting a highly idiosyncratic article in place, of, uh, in place of the Stephen Jay Gould articles which had appeared in the previous 300 issues so perhaps the circumstances were were special, but I, I, I thought it dishonest to change my words or put in his own words after we had agreed. But so there are editors and editors. In, um, in 1990, uh, around Christmas time, when I was in England, um, one of the papers, one of the, the big Sundays, um, approached me as they approached others to say what has been your favourite book this year and I said that it was a book I wrote that it was a book called Wonderful Life by Stephen J. Gould uh, and, um, and I talked about the book um, I had never met Stephen at that time although I read whenever I could his monthly articles in Natural History and I'd also read his, his great serious monograph on ontogeny and phylogeny in 77. Um, and uh, I particularly liked Wonderful Life which was as lyrical as it was encyclopedic and, uh, and it gave one a um, a tremendous feeling for the for the sheer luck or bad luck which could befall animals or plants and the huge role of chance. Um, one of the things Stephen said in the book was if we could rerun evolution it, it would be completely different. Uh, you know it's only a particular combination of contingencies which have produced us. This was a thought very much in my mind when I wrote the, as it were, the posthumous article for him on astrobiology, what form might evolution have taken in other circumstances, on other planets, given different physical parameters. Um, 
Stephen wrote me a lovely letter. He said he'd seen this and he thanked me and he hoped we could meet. Um, there was some exchanging of letters, but we didn't meet until a, uh, a television journalist in Holland approached six people. Uh, Freeman Dyson was one of them, Stephen Jay Gould was another, uh, um, uh, and there were two philosophers, and there was Rupert Sheldrake, and we were all separately interviewed, and then we were, we, we were put, we were to be brought together in Amsterdam, put in separate hotels, uh, none of us had met the other, with the notion there would be some wonderful and possibly violent confrontation as, uh, as six brilliant but very different minds uh, all, all jammed together. Um, uh, in, the, um, in the interview which was done with me, I, um, they said, do, do you know Stephen Jay Gould? And I said, no, I've, I've never met him, although we have corresponded. I said, I, I think of him as a brother. Um, now I'm going to say something which, which may have to be omitted. They, went, they mentioned the other figures, whom uh, I'd also not met, um, but admired. And they said, and what about Rupert Sheldrake? And I said, who's he? Um, later, after we'd all met, I, I wrote a letter, and a very nice letter, and sent a book to Rupert Sheldrake. I never got an answer, and I think he must have seen this, this, uh, this awful and indiscreet piece of television. But anyhow, we were all brought together in Amsterdam um, in a program which was called A Glorious Adventure, and which conflated the individual interviews with the meeting. So it was there that I met Stephen Jay Gould, and there that I met Freeman Dyson, both of whom became friends and played an important part in my life. Uh, Stephen taught at Harvard, but he lived here in the village, and we were within walking distance, neighbours. Uh, in fact, Stephen loved walking, and he had a huge architectural knowledge of New York and of old New York and of what was there a hundred years ago and the um, uh, there were so many different aspects to Stephen. He was extremely musical. He adored Gilbert and Sullivan. I think he knew all Gilbert and Sullivan by heart. On one occasion when we went out to a mutual friend on Long Island and Stephen basked in the jacuzzi for three hours, keeping the water warm and singing, uh, singing Gilbert and Sullivan. He also knew a huge number of war songs. Um, the, we got on well together. I admired him and I often wrote him letters, precipitate letters, after articles of his. Um, so, um, so this was not a forced thing. Um, I bewailed the fact. Uh, I said, I'm, I, I wish I were a real scientist like you. And he wrote me back a marvelous letter and said, you know, you are, but you are a scientist of the individual. And this is not a scientist of populations. And, 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 and you are unique in your way and, and don't do yourself down. Um, I never had too much intellectual self-confidence, but uh, Stephen, Stephen was a booster and a very positive force. Um, I went up to Harvard sometimes and I heard him lecture, and he was an incredible lecturer. The place would be packed, there would be 300 people there. And, um, and he was very open to students visiting him. Uh, uh, Stephen was... was uh, and, uh, and Rhonda, his, his wife, um, were, were, were um, impulsively generous. Um, and Stephen um, uh, arranged a lot of birthday parties for me. He would always himself bake a birthday cake for me using his mother's recipe, um, uh, a recipe she gave me after he died. Because, uh, um, and he would always... Um, he would invent uh, 
um, um, he, he himself would always write a doggerel poem which he would recite and he was very good at this he could sort of on one occasion he turned out a sort of a version of Jabberwocky which was which was marvelous and, uh, and, and, and and for me and for my birthday um, on another occasion knowing that I liked elements he insisted that everyone come as an element um, uh, I'm rather bad at names and sometimes at faces and for example uh, there was a particular man whom I remember as Argon but I don't know his name and I can't remember his face if people will identify with an element I never forget them um, the um, uh, one close friend yes Helen um, she she was 40 and 40 is zirconium and she has zircons all over her she uh, zircons are beautiful jewels um, the so there was a, 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 a lovely contact both personal and professional I think I was very lucky here because from what I've heard and what I've read um, not all contacts with Stephen with Stephen were so genial but I think it was easier because I was not in his line. I was no competitor. And um, similarly, I get on very well with botanists. And I get on well with chemists because they appreciate my interest in their subject. But at the same time, I'm not competing in their subject. So um, Stephen loved that I love zoology. Stephen had a brush with death when he was 40 or so he got a very rare and malignant tumour called a mesothelioma and this almost certainly because he had had contact with asbestos in the old buildings at Harvard 99% um, or more than 90% of people with mes mesothelioma don't make it um, Stephen was determined to make it and uh, and he felt he would be one of the lucky ones and he was one of the lucky ones aided by very heavy radiation and chemotherapy um, but he um, he had a he'd had a very strong personal experience of deep illness and and facing death and I think that when he came out of the other side this he'd always been energetic I think this energized him even more uh, there was not a minute to waste who knew what might happen next I think maybe his heightened and creative sense of contingency may have been partly uh, inspired by the mesothelioma in January of 2002 um, Stephen wrote an interesting article about numbers he brought out that he had written 300 articles for natural history in 25 years one article every month uh, that exactly a hundred years ago his great-grandfather or whatever had arrived at Ellis Island and there were many many numerical ratios and coincidences he brought up it was a, a strange article and in retrospect I uh, I can't help wondering whether there was something ominous about it uh, or premonitory um, then in I think March of you know I'm, I'm sorry this is January of 2001 uh, I, I, I don't know if I can if I can say this um, all, all what I've just said was in January of 2001 in an article which which um, in retrospect I couldn't help thinking had something ominous or premonitory about it although Stephen appeared in his usual health and spirits but uh, shortly after this at a routine medical examination uh, he was found to have a cancer in the chest 
with metastases to the brain and the lungs. Uh, stage four cancer uh, of a particularly malignant sort. Um, he was determined to complete what work he could. Um, the two metastases in the brain were removed and he continued to do his classes at Harvard. Uh, at that time, you know, because he'd had brain surgery on mo both sides, they left just a central ridge of hair, like a sort of, um, like an Indian chief. Uh, I, I believe the style of hair has a special name. Um, and uh, the only concession he made to illness was that he would sit instead of standing. He had just managed also to complete his big book on the structure of evolutionary thought. Um, huge book, 1500 pages. His magnum opus or his magnum opus after ontogeny and phylogeny. Um, and he'd also referred to the big book and that it had been exactly, yes, that's right, exactly 25 years. Ontogeny and phylogeny had come out in 77, then he had spent 25 years, among other things, writing monthly articles, and now on the 25th anniversary of his first big book, another even bigger book. The only, there was an emo, some emotional breakdown at Stephen's final lecture. Uh, he wept and many of the students wept. He came back to New York and almost instantly plunged into coma and died. Um, it was as if he had kept himself going by sheer willpower and then having completed his teaching, having seen the book out, he was ready to, to let things go. And uh, he was only 60. Um, one also has the dark feeling one can't help wondering in people who've had double cancers like this whether treatment for the first cancer, especially heavy radiation, might have led to the second cancer. Uh, this question arose with Susan Sontag, who survived an evil cancer 20 years earlier and then developed another cancer. And it also happened with my good friend Ralph Siegel, who first developed a lymphoma in the throat had heavy radiation to it and then developed a brain tumor. Whether this is just doubly bad luck or, or, or whether treatment itself of this intensity can prove mortal later, I don't know. It's an uncomfortable thought.